morning to everybody and happy Easter on this uh, beautiful uh, March day. We are glad that you're a part of our worship service today and we warmly welcome you to everything that we do here at First Presbyterian and especially that breakfast downstairs as uh, Reverend Collins was saying. It's excellent. I've had my share of it already, I know. Not only does Easter engender hopes for the future and the present, it, it can also stir up some, uh, some good memories of some pretty good stories. As baseball Hall of Famer New York Yankee, New York Yankee Mickey Mantle's funeral about uh, 20 years ago, sports commentator Bob Costas reminded uh, the crowd of uh, one of Mickey's uh, favorite stories about himself uh, arriving at the pearly gates. As Mr. Mantle envisioned it, St. Peter shakes his head and says, we checked your record, Mick. Sorry, we can't let you in. But before you go, God wants to know if you can sign these six dozen baseballs. <laughs> it seemed as if uh, Mr. Mantle thought his own ticket to paradise was in jeopardy. On this day, when we think of things eternal in nature, as Job said, God has put eternity into the mind of man. We wonder about our prospects to live in paradise here and in paradise beyond. And what is necessary along the, along the road of life to assure both? I'm reminded of the humorous cowboy poem one of our members shared with me a couple of years ago. Um, it speaks to the importance of keeping in touch with God. Jake the rancher went one day to fix a distant fence. The wind was cold and gusty and the clouds rolled gray and dense. As he pounded the last staples in and gathered, gathered tools to go, the temperature had fallen. The wind and snow began to blow. When he finally reached his pickup, he felt a heavy heart. From the sound of that ignition, he knew it wouldn't start. So Jake did what most of us would do if we had been there. He humbly bowed his head and sent aloft a prayer. As he turned the key for the last time, he softly cursed his luck, and they found him three days later no longer living in that old truck. Now, Jake had been around in life and done his share of roaming, but when he saw heaven, he was shocked. It looked just like Wyoming. Of all the saints in heaven, his favorite was St. Peter, so they sat and talked a minute or two, or maybe it was three. Nobody was keeping score. In heaven, time is free. I've always heard Jake said to Pete that God will answer prayer, but one time I asked for help, well, he just plain wasn't there. Does God answer prayers of some and ignore the prayers of others? That don't seem exactly square. I know all men are brothers. Now I ain't trying to act smart, it's just the way I feel. And I was wondering, could you tell me, what the heck's the deal? Peter listened very patiently, and when Jake was done, there were smiles of recognition, and he said, so you're the one. That day your truck wouldn't start, and you sent a prayer a flying. You gave us all real bad time, with hundreds of us trying. A thousand angels rushed to check the status of your file, but you know, Jake, we hadn't heard from you in quite a while. And though all prayers were answered and God ain't got no quota, he didn't recognize your voice and he started a truck in Minnesota. <laughs> now we see the importance of, of keeping in touch with God. Now we know that God has a sense of humor. We know that. After all, Jesus seemed to enjoy his friends and probably had quite a few laughs with them. He tells his apostles in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, not too long before he went to the cross, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's examine the Easter story quickly and its messages for us today. One of the most important ones is that its entire message rocked the establishment of religion. It started with the forgiveness in the cross, and then the triumphant victory over death in the tomb. The resurrection reordered and it redefined the way faith went about its business. Out with the old, in with the new. There are all kinds of parallels in society. When the new is introduced, the old seems to fade away because the new was such a good idea. When Paul McCartney brought his idea of the song yesterday to a recording session of the Beatles, his bandmate suggested that he sing alone, accompanying himself on the guitar. But English producer George Martin, who passed away just a few weeks ago, had another idea, urging McCartney to add a string quartet to the mix. 
Paul McCartney's response was, oh, no, no, we're, we're a rock and roll band. I don't think that's a good idea. The producer shot back, let's try it. And if it doesn't work, we won't use it, and you just do your solo version. Well, the rest is history, as we know. Yesterday has been voted the best song of the 20th century by a variety of sources. Morton would introduce a double string quartet to the Beatles recording of Eleanor Rigby, a song about the neglect and the loneliness of the elderly, which helped expand the Beatles' appeal beyond the traditional rock and roll enthusiasts. As one paper said, USA Today, Mr. Martin helped the Beatles redefine and transcend rock. God broke convention when he rolled a stone away on that first Easter centuries ago. It was as if he put a string quartet at the entrance of the tomb in the majesty and the beauty of what had just happened. Jesus redefined and he transcended the current religious culture with an opposite set of values, love instead of hate, forgiveness instead of retribution, inclusion instead of exclusion, freedom instead of oppression. And with the prospect for a different set of values would come resistance to the fact of that rolled away stone. The religious elite in that day, they were so threatened that they went as far as bribing the soldiers who were standing at guard to fabricate a story that would go like this, as Matthew reports. You were to say that his disciples came and stole him away at night while you were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, Pontius Pilate, we will take care of him and we will keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the bribe and did what was instructed. You know, it's quite incredible to think that those in religious power would go to such desperate measures to keep the truth from getting out, bribing Roman guards to tell the opposite of what really happened. But their desperation, you see, validates even more the resurrection. The panic in Jerusalem set off signals that something miraculous had happened at the tomb. Who would have ever guessed that the disciples in their underground hiding would ever see their master again? Yet when the woman discovered the empty tomb, Jesus told them to tell the disciples to go ahead to Galilee and I will see them there. You know, the world would never experience an event like this again, as we know. All of a sudden, in addition to the current values being turned upside down, the transitory nature of life had surrendered to the eternal promise of life forever. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the body is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. The body is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Paul also tells us in 2 Corinthians, we are looking all the time not at the visible things, but we're looking at the invisible. The visible things are transitory. It is the invisible things that are really permanent. Now, not, now, not only does Easter give us hope for the future, it gives us hope for today, my friends. And that's why we live in a moment that God created for us. Surrounded by the joy of Christ's love, surrounded by the joy of Christ's teachings, and surrounded by the joy of Christ's resurrection. Jesuit priest James Martin wrote yesterday in the Wall Street Journal about the resurrection. A person, he said, who rises from the grave, who demonstrates his power over death, and has proved his divine authority, he needs to be listened to. What that person says demands a response. In short, he said, the resurrection makes a claim on you. And with this understanding comes yours and my ticket to paradise. It was certainly the disciples' ticket after they emerged from hiding and had a brand new lease on life, empowered and energized to change the world with the life-changing and the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. The disciples were no longer asking the question, what's in it for me? But what's in it for God? What's in it for the betterment of God's kingdom? When you and I arrive at this point with this attitude, we will have punched our ticket to paradise because there is no better path to take than the path of self-awareness through Jesus Christ. 
Presbyterian pastor Tom Toole said that we have to find a bigger vision than ourselves or we will be tempted to be governed only by our own issues. And therefore, we take instruction and we take inspiration from such modern-day martyrs as Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, Jesus was the man for others. And when you and I become the person for others, then we will have discovered paradise here on earth. Former Kansas State University football player and former NFL player John McGraw was our speaker just several days ago at our first academy program uh, just last uh, uh, Monday night. And John delivered an excellent talk, including remarks about how many are in perpetual pursuit of infinite goals. And when they reach one goal, there's always the next one. There's always the next one. And there's always the next one. Without any core holding their pursuit together. There's a constant restlessness without any redemptive quality. You quickly become, you see, your own center of the universe, which in the long run becomes exhausting and exasperating. You never know where you're going to end up. You never know where you want to end up. Here's that story of former Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who while on a train one day conducted, uh, anticipated the conductor coming to ask him for his ticket. And as the conductor approached uh, Wendell Holmes, he could see that the justice was searching all over for his ticket, you know, in his, in his pockets, in his briefcase, in his wallet. And when the conductor arrived at the seat, he told the justice, he said, Justice, don't worry about it. We, we know who you are. Everybody knows who you are, so don't worry about producing your ticket. And the justice said to him, no, sir, that's not the problem. I don't know where I'm going. Do you know where you are going, both today and tomorrow? Where are you going? Do you feel you have a ticket to paradise? If not, there is an answer. If you believe in the power of Christ's resurrection, you won't have the problem of not knowing where you are going. For Christ's guiding light will guide you in the direction of a clear destination. And that destination is service and love to others, for you will no longer become the center of your life. But others will become the center of your life. And you will live by discovering that, by getting that ticket. You will live every day with resolve and purpose. There will be no more searching. There will be no more scrambling for the right ticket. Paul tells us in Romans, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. If you are new to this church, we invite you to begin this journey with us today. For here, or in any body of Christ, meaning the church, you will find strength, believe me, to meet your greatest challenges. You will find support, believe me, to meet your greatest heartbreaks. And you will live life, believe me, with much greater purpose and resolve. Hallelujah! The Lord is risen.